I bought these defunct rental bikes as a pair for $75 each. This one we got running again, it was a nightmare. The thing was electronically bricked. We had to hack the battery release, replace the electronics, and actually make new parts to get it all to work right. But in the end, it was worth it. This is the perfect commuter bike. It has a belt drive, a three-speed hub, and of course, electric assist. So with that experience under our belt, it should be easier to restore the second one, right? Wrong. This one is way worse. It has missing parts that we can't buy, the hub motor is locked up in one direction, and it has the same extinct hardware as its twin did. This bike belongs in a landfill, but wouldn't that be a shame? If we could bring this thing back to life, someone could use it for reliable transportation. That's reason enough to try. But at what cost? Let's find out. now remembering why I never wanted to look at one of these bikes ever again. They are such a pain to work on. I am doing all this to get the front wheel off. This is the moment that could bring us to the landfill. To find another front wheel hub motor with all these features is going to be prohibitively expensive. This is the can of worms to end all cans of worms, and so it's the first thing we're going to get into. I don't want to sink a bunch of time into this bike to find out that this is impossible. This little screw over here is loose. Could it be securing something inside of here that is now jammed up? I'm gonna try tightening that and then see if the wheel turns and then this is the moment of truth. The power is connected to the other bike. It's got the same connector. I have an extension cable. Turn it on, hit the throttle switch very lightly and we'll see if anything explodes. Not a thing. We've got a brushless motor and some gears. Is this fixable? Yes, of course, anything is fixable, but why is this board fried? We're getting into a situation where the deeper we dig, the worse this could get, and the more time we could sink into this. Could we possibly replace that front wheel? Well, the big problem with that is that this cover from the hub actually engages with the brake. We'd have to have a whole new wheel with the same spline up there, which we don't, so this is gonna get really expensive if we can't fix that little circuit board. These traces all look like they're broken, but actually I'm getting continuity across every single one of them. We have to dig deeper. Could it be that we just clean it and it works again? This motor is completely toast. There's no way we're getting it working again. We could if it was the apocalypse, but I wouldn't feel good about it. This bike's either going to the landfill or we're gonna replace that front wheel. I have one, a hub motor front wheel. It'll work if I make some spacers for it, but we're not gonna be able to get that front brake working. I thought of getting a disc brake to work on it by drilling custom mounts. No can do. There's nowhere to mount a rim brake. And yes, we could find an old fork that fits this bike. It's not gonna match. And honestly, I don't wanna keep pouring more and more parts into this thing. So we're gonna build a bike that only has a rear brake. I love redundancy, but that rear brake there is really reliable. So at least we know that this is the wheel we're using now. I'll make it fit. For now, we've got a lot of other stuff to do on this bike. So let's start airing it apart and dig into the electronics. Now, as we disassemble this bike, some of the parts and wires are staying and some of them need to be replaced. This was once a rental bike that worked with an app and there's no clean way to unlock the existing electronics. I know this after speaking with countless technicians and engineers familiar with these bikes. The thing is bricked. It's e-waste and it's a shame. These rental companies should unlock their bikes at the end of their lives, but they don't. So the best we can do is save what we can and replace what we need to. 
Here we have the electronics that are getting installed on the bike. We're gonna test it on the workbench. Here's the motor controller, the screen, the throttle, and the pedal assist sensor, which is actually torque sensing. I'll explain that later. All right, everything's connected to the battery we're actually using. The screen is on. We're gonna just throttle test it. Nice. All right, we're up and running. This is great. We know our electronics work, but there's a fair bit of stuff we're keeping on the bike. I've labeled all that, including the brake outputs, lights, and some of the wiring. But not all of this will just plug in or fit. So let's mount the controller and tackle each item one by one. Okay, we've got pretty much everything run. We're missing the tail light, but whatever goes here, we have a connection for. Up here at the handlebars, this original screen is not gonna work, but we've got all the cables run for this one. And then this one's tricky. The motor wire was stuck way up in this fork. I had to fish it out so we could connect the new one, but it's run and ready to go. And down here, the power connector is gonna hook right up to the new controller easily. It even has the same ends here on the positive and negative, which I can't believe. But you might notice we're missing some pretty important things like the latch that holds this battery into the bike. Let me take you over to this bike's twin and I'll show you how it's supposed to work. On this bike, the battery latch is intact. See, the battery is secured. If you flip this switch, it comes out. This was quite sophisticated. Originally, this bike had some kind of a key card scanner here. You'd swipe your transponder and the battery would pop out for service. We had to hack it and hook up this polarity reversing switch so that it would move the actuator in or out. We can't hack the other bike because there's nothing there to hack. But I already did some leg work. This test piece fits in exactly like the old latch. I did it by tracing the profile of the power connector, scanning it into my computer, and 3D modeling the rest. That gets us some of the way there, but then how does the battery actually stay in? I used the other bike to take measurements of the battery latch, then I tried to replicate it as best I could with a series of parts, including a spring, a shift cable, and some clamps. After futzing around with several prototypes, I ended up with this. Let's see if it fits. Okay, doesn't come out. <laughs> It's like witchcraft. Doesn't fit perfectly. We're gonna have to make some adjustments, but when we do, we can print this out on some tougher filament and I'll show you how it all goes together. Okay, these are on polycarbonate, so they're really tough. This is the latch body and this is a latch bolt. We actually take a bicycle shift cable and put it through the latch bolt, just like this. And then the little end of the shift cable stops it from going any further. Then a spring fits into the back of the latch bolt. It all goes together into the latch body. And then as you can see, the spring makes it work. Then we have this little lever here. This is what actually pulls the cable through the latch body. The shift cable goes through it. It butts right up to the back. And then we put this little cable clamp on it. Once we've tightened the clamp, you pull this in any direction and it moves the latch bolt. What might look like clever engineering is just because I'm not precise enough to make it fit any other way. I'm kind of in disbelief right now. I thought I was gonna end up using a Voli strap and then I ended up messing around with it at night and it's possible. I didn't even show you this over here. I'm just blown away that this is possible now. I'm gonna have to make a few adjustments to this, but once I do, I can connect the bottom part of the battery that actually supplies power, and we can start firing things up and getting this bike working. Last 
time it took me the better part of a morning to stuff all those wires in that controller in there. This time the controller is smaller and there are actually fewer wires and I still can barely get it in there. Having all this powered up is a nice milestone, but we're far from finished. We have to put the front wheel on and see if it spins. So of course this wheel doesn't fit in this fork, but I made some adapters. Of course I 3D printed them because that's the only way I know how to make anything and you might not think they're strong enough, but in a moment, I'm gonna prove to you they are because I made something else out of the same material. This, this is what I made. It's an adapter for those dang security nuts. I keep using this big channel lock to brute force them on and off. They only need 30 foot pounds of torque, 40 Newton meters. I tested this up to 70 and it works just fine. Check it out. And actually the mud guard blocked this from fully bearing on the nut. So that wasn't optimal, no damage. I could use this again and again. Fiber filled PPA for static loads is super strong. So I can make spacers to my heart's content, even if they're really getting clamped down on. But we gotta see this wheel spin. But does it work? Yes, it does, but we're not gonna be using a throttle switch for this bike, we're using torque sensing pedal assist, and that's not gonna work on the workbench, and so we have to stitch this up and put it on the ground to test it. The weather's pretty bad now, so I gotta test this in the shop. Oh yeah! <laughs> it kicked in for like a second there, but oh man. So later I will demonstrate why torque sensing is so much better, but right now we have to deal with all of this. This screen's a really important part of the bike and we're gonna have to replace it. As you can see on the other bike, this bezel makes the new e-bike screen fit, but on this one, it was a rectangle. It was very easy to 3D model. That one's not even a polygon. It's got curves and all sorts of weird stuff on it. It took a lot of doing. I had to trace it like I did the battery latch, but I was able to make a bezel and now it should all go back together seamlessly. So the headlight is not working. It's not there to light your path. It's there for safety. Most bikes don't have a headlight, but we want it working. I already tested the power plug. There's power going to the headlight and it's still not working. We gotta take it apart and see what's going on. Okay. Let's take a look at this thing. Let's start by testing it. See if it was the plug or something like that. It's a six volt light, but this 3.7 volt battery should turn it on at least a little bit. Okay, nothing. Let's try reversing the polarity. Huh, I think this is a different polarity from the plug on the bike and the new controller. If we just switch the pins around, it should work. So this here is the factory plug and you can see there are these two little pins. If we pull those pins out with some care and snap them back in the other way, it should turn right on when we plug it into the new controller. Okay, before we put all this together again, let's dry test it. So I should just hold this plus button. Yes, the headlight is on. We solved the issue. So the bike is mostly working. We've got the headlight figured out. The tail light is another story because as I mentioned, we don't even have one. I was saving this for last because we're gonna make one. All right, this is a little enclosure I made with a little grommet at the back for the wire. And then this piece 
is translucent, that's the lens. And you can see there are these little holes here. That's where the LEDs are gonna go. Let me show you how it all goes together. Now, of course, this was just another excuse to model and 3D print something. It's like my little reward for completing that whole bike. I get to tinker and actually make something cool. And this doesn't have to be bright. It's just so you can see the bike. And so these little red LEDs are gonna do just fine. And I know they're stable at six volts, which is perfect. This bike is all but complete. It's almost ready to test ride. But first, I wanna see if we can peel off these old decals and do a little better. Who knew? There's another Gotcha logo under there. Now I have about an hour of adhesive removal to do. And we'll probably just leave it at that and stare at it. But why? Why restore this? Why take a $75 bike and put close to $500 into it? Because in this case, it's very much worth it. This bike has a belt drive, a Sturmy Archer hub, a big comfortable seat, super functional basket. To buy a bike like this with this type of function would cost you over $2,000 most likely. This thing is very low maintenance. I barely had to do anything to it besides the electronic. It's made like an appliance to just keep going and going. It'd be a perfect bike for somebody like my mom who wants a comfortable bike that's functional that she doesn't have to maintain. And I must say, I like this bike a lot better than the other one, if only for the pneumatic tire in the front. It makes the ride quality way better. And that torque sensing pedal assist, it's just more fun, it's more rewarding, it feels like you're doing the work. It responds proportionally as you are pressing on the crank. It doesn't just sense that the crank is spinning or sense the speed that the crank is spinning. It actually responds like you are pedaling. So it's safer and more intuitive to ride and it's more enjoyable. So if I donate any of these bikes, it's gonna be the other one. It's plenty functional. It's been proven to work for months and months and months. If you love these videos and you like going fast, check out my new Tunnel Vision shirt, available in the link below. Tunnel Vision is what you get when you're thinking about the path ahead and nothing else. This one I'm gonna keep around to tinker with for demonstrations, and just because it's cool, I really like it. I even like the way it looks. If we don't start restoring bikes like this, we're gonna have a huge e-waste problem with these e-bikes because a lot of people just can't fix them. Sometimes it's not so straightforward. You can't just pull a part off the shelf to make them work, but I'm here to show you it's possible. And while we went overboard with the 3D printer and customizations, you can get them working with a lot less. So hope you enjoyed this video today. I hope you learned something, and if you didn't, I hope you at least found it entertaining. Thanks for riding with me today, and I'll see you next time.